Welcome to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One, where I explore the world of geocaching. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts or on the Geocache Adventures Facebook page. You can also follow Geo Adventures on Buy Me a Coffee for a behind the scenes look on every episode. That's one word G E O Adventures. It's free to follow, or you can become a member and unlock exclusive posts and information. Your memberships go a long way for helping support the podcast and are greatly appreciated. Hello everybody, Amy Shadow Dragon one here, and today we're going to talk about hazards of geocaching, more specifically hazards of being out in the woods and remote areas. And to join me to discuss this today is media specialist Dan from the Missouri Department of Conservation. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Amy. Appreciate the invitation to come on and talk to your listeners. I appreciate you accepting it. (laughs) (laughs) So there's a lot of geocaches that, well, I don't know if we'd say a lot, but there are several geocaches that are in wooded or remote areas. And sometimes things can get a little hairy when we're out there. Anywhere from a full emergency to the more common irritations of the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And you agreed to kind of help us sort through and find some ways on how to deal with some of the stuff and how to be better prepared. Sure, sure. My first question for you is on the trails through the, the conservation areas when we're hiking them, they're typically marked and they're, they seem fairly maintained what should we actually expect to see for these trails as far as like their condition and maintenance wise for a marked trail sure well first of all i would always recommend uh especially if you're going on to an unfamiliar trail for the first time uh i would regardless of how easy it may seem or how easy you assume it will be or how well it seems to be marked when you're starting out Uh, I would definitely always get a trail map to bring with me. And most of our areas have maps um, that are uh, at the trailheads that you can pick up, but sometimes they do run out. So it wouldn't hurt as a precaution to go to our website, uh, mdc.mo.gov. Very top of the um, page, you'll find a discover nature tab. And then under that tab, there's places to go. Click on that, and that will take you to our online database of all of our areas. So anytime you can look up an area by uh, the county, the name of the area, the facilities it has, and all that. And you can basically click on that and and download a PDF map uh, that you can put on your phone or print out or whatever you want so you have it with you. Another option is we have a Mo Outdoors app, free online uh, mobile app that you can download either from our site or for uh, Apple uh app site or the google play site and uh, that will also uh help you use the gps on your phone to navigate our trails and stuff so it's always good to have that in your back pocket just in case okay um there aren't any maps there so maps first thing compass is a good idea too Uh, i'm going to assume that geocasters are going to have a geo uh uh, um, a gps (laughs) on them so that's always a good thing too and i always go ahead and track my my uh my walk even if i think it's going to be simple just to log it just to have that but you just never know something might happen and you could get turned around or something so that's the first thing you want to do um the second thing is uh the the conditions of the trails can vary if you if you hike nearer to an urban area like the st louis area um we tend to have more maintained trails because they're more heavily used and we have tend to have the largest number of staff in the urban areas to to manage those trails but as you get out into some of the more rural areas and the more challenging trails, sometimes they can be a little challenging to follow. So hence, again, having that map, uh, a compass as a backup for your GPS and all that, just to be able to help navigate if you need to uh, need it. That's also very helpful. Um, as far as the conditions of the trails, our trails are fairly well maintained. But again, depending on where you go, difficulty of the trail and how much staff is in a particular area, Sometimes there will be down trees. There will be some things that you know you may have to navigate over. Maybe our staff doesn't know about those things yet. So there's definitely couldn't you could encounter some challenges. So I'd just be prepared for for you know whatever contingency uh, as far as that's concerned. Um, and we you know we do maintain our trails, but we don't manicure them. So we don't constantly trim every little weed that comes over into the trail. So. There will be some areas that could get grassy or whatever, depending on the nature of where the trail goes through. 
Okay. So there's there could be a wide variety of things. Good ideas not not to hike with shorts on, even though it's tempting in the warm weather. But uh, the, that barrier, that pants leg, will help protect you from things like chiggers, ticks, poison ivy, uh, stinging nettle, anything chiggers, whatever you might want to might want to come across. So if we do see something on a trail like thorn bush growing over it or a downed tree or something, can you reach out and report that sort of stuff to the conservation department and let them know so that it can be dealt with? And how often does that kind of thing happen for you guys? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you do see some major thing, like, I'm not talking about a couple of limbs, right. but I mean, you know, a major tree down on, on a, a trail or something that's v- heavily washed out or something like that, uh, which very difficult to, to uh, pass over, uh, definitely, definitely let us know. You can, um, again, that area brochure I told you that you could mention that you could download mm-hmm. from uh, online or that a lot of times at the trailhead. That will have a number on there that you can call the office that's in, that's in charge of that particular uh, trail and let them know that. And obviously with your GPS, if you can log that spot uh, where you've seen the problem or at least describe it as best you can, if you don't have a GPS, uh, you didn't lay down a, 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 a waypoint or something there, then get us as close as possible to where it is on the trail. And uh, that way we can go when they have an opportunity to go out and clear that obstacle. Okay. That's, that's a good tip for trail markers. Another reason why the maps and GPS would be a great backup to have, but trail markers, you know, they often they're wood or some kind of post that can get damaged. How often do you typically, and it may depend on the area, but how often do you typically check to see what kind of condition the trail markers are in? Sure. So um, I would love to tell you that we go out there every day and make sure that all the trail markers are everything's great and good to go. But no, the reality is we don't. Uh, we typically have limited staffs, again, depending on what areas, the heavily used areas are probably going to be better marked more consistently. Some of the outbound ones, maybe not quite as frequently. Um, so basically, I did ask our recreational use specialist about that. And he also used to be um, one of the crews that, that maintain trails. Um, you know, basically they might get out once a year to check all that stuff, uh, unless there's a particular need, uh, where they're doing a reroute for a trail or they're doing some kind of special maintenance on a trail or building one, creating another trail or an an offshoot trail, or if somebody reports something like the down tree, like we talked, then they will go out and, and, and do that. So yes, it is highly possible markers could get lost, um, fall off uh vandalized you know lots of kinds of things can occur and and i and i can't tell you that all of our markers look identical because sometimes we have the little square guy you know with the hiker guy symbol right. emblem sometimes it'll say trail sometimes it'll be some flagging tied around trees or it might be an arrow so there's different things that are marked the trail so they're not 100 percent consistent some of our trails actually have distance markers on them you know one mile a mile and a half two miles not all of them do though so it does vary quite a bit again can't emphasize enough have that trail map with you um and you hear your gps and what heart even have a compass just in case sometimes the compass is convenient just to get your bearing on right you already got your gps do the trail maps note what types of markers are used along the different trails not typically not no. typically okay yeah they will um they will give you features along the trail, like creeks, uh, if there's overlook platforms, parking lots, um, and uh, the the uh, maps have green area for forested areas and white for open areas. So you will kind of get that idea. And they have some topography as well. So um, topography online. So that will help you kind of navigate some stuff, but they don't actually usually mark where trail markers are and stuff. Okay. I've seen some that do, but they're kind of the exception. So I wouldn't count on that in most of our areas. Okay. Okay. Probably the most common nuisance for just outside in general is insects. From mm-hmm. biting flies to ants, mosquitoes, the nasty chickers we've already mentioned a little bit about. Mm-hmm. And, and as you mentioned, um, long pants, long sleeves would help avoid some of these um bug spray we all know 
is also helpful. But does bug spray help actually deter all of these nuisances? And is there a specific type of bug spray that works best versus some of the others? Sure. Well, a couple um, good old standby is DEET, um, available in a lot of different brand name products. You can get it just about anywhere from department stores to hardware stores, sporting goods stores, drug stores, pretty easily to come by. Uh, and so that's a good thing to spray that deters a lot of insects and basically it confuses their senses so they can't detect you. Basically, it's like a cloaking device oh, for, you know, okay. so they, they can't detect your, um, your, your signature basically from your, uh, 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 what am I trying to say? Your camera, you know, the chemicals that you give off and stuff like that, it confuses their senses so they can't detect you. Um, so that's a good thing to have and spray on, spray on your body, spray on your clothes. Of course, you don't want to get in your eyes. That's pretty mouth and all that. That's common sense stuff. There's another chemical that works a little bit differently. It's called permethrin with a P and that's available. You're not going to find that quite as commonly, uh, but most of your sporting goods stores, a lot of department stores might have it. Um, and that's a, a chemical you spray on your clothing, not on your skin. It's not for skin contact. You pre-treat your clothing with it, let it soak in and dry into the clothing. Sometimes they recommend even going two rounds, let the spray once, let it dry in, spray a second time, let that soak in and dry in. And then what that does is that it forms a um, deterrent on your clothing to deter insects and repel insects. And that will also last through several washings too. Oh. Not infinitely, but you can go through, I don't know, maybe half a dozen washings or something like that, but then you will need to retreat your clothes. You can also retreat your boots and everything else. So that's a good, that's good, a um, couple of good chemical things. There's a lot of other things that some people, uh, again, maybe they're kind of an urban legend, wives tales or whatever, they may or may not work. Like, you know, vanilla extract, I've heard people say, oh, that supposedly keeps some insects away. and. And there's some other uh, things. Um, Skin So Soft uh, is a product produced by Avon that supposedly keeps insects away. So there's different things that you could try. But DEET is definitely one that works. And permethrin also works as well, just in a different way. Okay. Uh, well, again, DEET for your skin or your clothes, permethrin only for your, your clothes. Um, and then the other thing is the physical barriers. We mentioned the long pants, but uh, what I like to do is, and when it is warmer, I like to get like a nylon thin, long pants and um, light colors are helpful. A, they keep your color, you know, cooler when the sun comes out, but they also enable you to see insects and things on your pants. So you can scrape them off oh. that might blend in if you had dark pants and not see them. Um, some people will go so far, depends on what kind of fashion sense you have, but they'll go so far as to tuck their, their uh, pant legs into their socks or wrap with duct tape around just to keep that to create that barrier from the bugs and ticks and other things getting in there um the other thing that will uh having that physical barrier on your legs will help for is uh plants like poison ivy or stinging nettle which is another thing that's probably the most uh, among the most common uh hazards in the outdoors okay so we talked about the promethean and how that's applied to clothes mm -hmm. for the deet and the other spray once is there a proper way to apply that because growing up what what my dad always had us did you did a spray along the cuffs of the pants up and down the out seam and inside seam of your legs once around the waist and then up and down your around your sleeves and up and down the arms is is there actually a proper way to apply a repellent or is it just kind of cover all the areas and you're good yeah, common sense, cover all the areas that you imagine an insect would get on uh, and be special attention to your cuffs, your legs, your arms, things like that. Uh, the other thing I would not do, and I'm sure this, again, this is common sense, is don't spray it in your face. Right. You know, the best way is to spray some on your hand and rub on your face. Um, so that's one one thing you can do. Uh, and children, there's they usually have some uh, deep for kids, some of those products that have a little bit lower of that chemical in there that's a little bit better for kids. So if you got young ones, you might want to get the special kids version of it. Okay. But so that's helpful. But uh, if you're going out into some deep woods, the stronger concentrations are better. Um, you know, so and you may have to reapply it if you're sweating or it's been a while or whatever, you might need to reapply it because it could, 
you know, sweat off. Periodically, you might want to spray yourself down a little bit more if you're going to be out there for an extended period. Okay, that's good to know. Um, ticks. Ticks are a big nuisance. They carry lots of different diseases. Mm-hmm. And people are aware, don't go out into the woods without spray you can get ticks but they're also in other areas so you can you tell us where all you can expect ticks to be lurking oh boy <laughs> just about anywhere where there's some kind of grass or leaves or foliage they can be found almost anywhere uh i've gotten them really bad before walking through grasses like uh, uh prairie type grasses um and um they but they can be in the woods too and basically what they do they have a, a behavior called questing where they stay on a piece of foliage like grass or or a leaf or something or branch and then wait for something to walk by and then they latch on to it and that something could be you and um so basically if there's a way to minimize your contact with those kinds of uh situations with the foliage directly uh one very common thing is just to stay on the trail as much as possible. If you get off the trail into the into the brush or the grass or or the, the leaves, you're more likely to to pick ticks up because that's where they'll be. If you can keep a, as much distance as you can from that, so much the better. Or spend the less least amount of time possible in the grass or the leaves. That will also help. Okay, and, and then that DEET and that Promethean, those bug sprays, they're going to be our best chance at repelling those. Correct? Yes, permethrin and, uh, and deep based products um, are, are really good. And then the same for your legs, for your arms, you know, wear a long sleeve shirt. I like to wear a loose fitting, light colored synthetic type shirt with, you can, you know, button the cuffs up. If you want to go so far as you put tape or whatever you want there too. Um, but again, keep that barrier uh, on your arms. Another thing, and this is getting into mosquitoes a little bit, but um, nets that you can put on your face or your hat will also help if you're in an area with a high concentration of mosquitoes, because they will get really annoying in your face and buzzing you and all that kind of stuff very quickly. Uh, and it seems like they go, they go in cycles. I can't tell you when it is, but there's sometimes when there's a hatch, the conditions are right, the moisture is right, and they'll just, you know, have a huge hatch. And for two or three weeks, they will just be absolutely miserable on a trail. Right. Um, and sometimes the best advice is if you are in one of those situations, just avoid that trail for three weeks or so and then come back. Hopefully okay. the mosquitoes will have um, dissipated by that point in time. But if you are in a situation where you are going to be encountering a lot of mosquitoes, I highly recommend a head net because that will really make life a lot easier for you. Okay. That's a good tip. Yeah. When it comes to ticks removing them as soon as possible is important but there's a proper way to do it because the most important thing is my understanding is to make sure that head gets removed yes that's true so what you want to do if you do find a tick embedded on you fortunately they don't exchange any of those pathogens for us immediately so you you know if you get it within a few hours you're probably okay but you want to get it off as soon as you can um so what you want to do is you get a pair of like fine tweezers and mm -hmm. they also spell sell special tick removing devices if you want to get one of those that would make life a little bit easier but a good thin a delicate pair of tweezers will also help um you just want to get grab that tick as close to the skin as possible we're practically pinching your skin not don't grab its body and pull it that way get right down there at the skin level and pull directly from the skin out directly out don't pull off to the side or anything like that pull it straight out and that'll give you the best chance of getting the whole tick out head and all so there's nothing left in there if you try to pull it off to the side you may break the head off in there if you grab the body and pull it by the body uh, you may break the head off or you may squeeze the tick and cause it to discharge stuff you know so you don't want to do that want to get right down at the surface of your skin and pull straight off in a firm but careful manner okay now disposing the tick after we pull them off i've always i've and and at this point i don't know exactly what's an old wives tale and what's true sometimes but i was always told growing up you don't crush a tick because you could release some of those pathogens that carry those diseases but i've also been told you don't wash it down the sink or flush it because they can crawl back out 
of the drain. So what is the actual best way to dispose of the tick once you remove it? My parents, my, my dad always said burn it, but then if people aren't using matches correctly, then that can cause other issues later on. So what is the best way to actually dispose of the tick after it's removed? Well, I would say uh, your first priority, like say you're outside, you find a tick on, you want to remove it, is to get it off you. Get right. it off you. And if it, all that means is throwing it back into the woods or whatever, okay, it's off you right now. Um, if you, um, I would say crushing it, I mean, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the pathogens just as long as you're not doing it with your fingers where you could, you know, get, I mean, like if you throw it on a concrete and you step on it, you're probably okay unless you're going to, you know, touch the bottom of your shoe or whatever, you know, just, just common sense. I mean, you're probably walking on a lot of unsanitary stuff at points anyway that you're not touching your shoe, you know, so it's probably no more than any more danger than that. I just wouldn't crush it anywhere where you could get it in contact with your skin or certainly open wounds or mouth or anything like that um yeah sure burning it works but yeah you don't always have that <laughs> don't always have that uh um you know uh opportunity now i have flushed them down the toilet run them down the sinks just anecdotally personally i've never had one come up but you know i i can't say it's not possible you know so yeah. i guess that would be one thing but i i think if you flush it down a toilet that's a lot of uh that's a lot of water down there. that's awful yeah. strong tick crawl for that i'm not sure why I think that was grandma said, don't ever flush it down the toilet. I really don't know where that came from. But when you're five, you just kind of do what yeah. grandma says to do. So, <laughs> Well, I suppose if for you threw it down the toilet and you didn't get in the water and it was on the side or something and it crawled back up. I mean, yeah, yeah that could possible. be an issue. But if you physically see it go down, I have a hard time believing it's going to make its way up. <laughs> if we get a tick and you're having a hard time removing it, what should you do? Because you don't want to go to the ER because you got a tick you can't remove. But, like, is there really a good solution if you can't seem to get the tick out with its head intact? Should you go um, to, like, an urgent care and get it taken care of? Or what's your it, advice it, there? It probably wouldn't hurt if you do have it stuck in some of it stuck in your body. Um, might not hurt to have it, you know, if you can't physically get it out. Because you do want to get that out there in case there is something. I mean, first of all, not every tick is going to have a disease that's going to affect you. In right. fact, most of them probably won't, but you just don't want to take that chance. Um, one thing also I didn't mention that is not a bad idea to do when you pull the tick out, even if you get it all out, is put some antiseptic or alcohol on there too, or hand sanitizer that's largely alcohol. So that'll help sanitize that as well. But yeah, I would say if there's something embedded in there and you can't get it out, it probably would be a good idea to get you to get some medical attention for it you know obviously it wouldn't be the top priority in the er but i mean you know just getting it making them know hey i got this you know i think i should probably get it out i have been able to get it out successfully but most of the time if you're careful you can get it out and then putting some antiseptic should should you know take care of any of the potential issues okay so poisonous plants poison ivy is is a big one is that like the most common poisonous plant in the u.s uh well i don't know about the u.s uh in general but i would say in missouri that's going to be probably the most common one you're going to encounter okay uh poison ivy and that is uh for those who are allergic to it um yeah that is quite a pain to have to deal with it uh it's very common in our state so you're likely to find it a lot of different places and you may not even have to go that far out into the woods to find it, it could be in backyards it could be in parks yeah uh, near creeks, you know, even in suburban areas. So, uh, yes, it's extremely common. It grows just about anywhere. Uh, any part of the plant, to those who are allergic, can create the reaction. So okay. if it's the leaves, okay. if it's the stems, the oils. I've even heard cases of people burning the plant and those oils getting into the smoke and breathing it in and getting irritation. So uh, just any part of the berries can do it, any part you touch. Um, but there's a dichotomy of poison ivy, though, is it's very irritating to those who are allergic to it. Um, however, it is a very good source and a completely natural source of food for a lot of wildlife right. that aren't allergic to it. So it does have a place in the in the ecosystem and, and not everyone is allergic to it. I myself am not. So I've touched it, I've had contact with it and never had poison ivy. Now that can change through your life. 
you know, but not everyone is allergic. So that's, that's a good thing for those who aren't, but for those who are, yes, it's extreme irritation. And um, again, it's going back to, uh, to help avoid it, a identify it. So you know what it looks like, you know, you've, a lot of us have heard the leaves of three, let it be. So you basically have a, a arrangement of three leaves, but there's a center one that sticks out uh, and is and more than the others. And then the other two are symmetrical on either side of it. So you have like a mirror image on either side. Uh, it's got hairy uh, stem-like roots. Uh, it has white berries that birds and wildlife really like. So those are a couple of things that you can kind of use to identify it. Good field guide will help to looking it up in the field guide so you can visually see it and identify it that way and just be careful and just know it's very common. Some of the barriers that we talked about with the long sleeve shirts and pants, not only do they go work great against ticks and chiggers and whatnot, but they also help provide a barrier to poison ivy. So less direct contact with your skin. And once again, uh, when you get back from the outing, if you've contacted poison ivy or suspect you may have, couple things to do get those clothes in the washing machine as quick as possible to wash right. those oils out same thing with ticks a lot of the same advice you know any potential ticks or whatever in there run it through the washing machine in the dryer and then get yourself in the shower and take a very thorough bath with soap again that will help you wash off insects or find the insects if they're on you or ticks which aren't technically insects but um and you would also help wash off poison ivy oils. So all that stuff, kind of same thing, as quick as possible. Okay. What other types of poisonous plants do we need to keep a lookout for? Well, there's one, it's called stinging nettle, and it tends to grow in um, uh, low areas near water. And uh, if you come into contact with stinging nettle, it's got like little tiny needles on its leaves and a little poison on there that will really be very irritating and make you itch and burn and it's very it can be very painful um mercifully though it doesn't last long it typically lasts for about an hour or two and then is done oh. then it just goes away on its own um so there's no no lingering issues from it but while you during that hour or two it can be very very uncomfortable and very painful um so uh, again, best barrier, back to the long pants, long sleeves. That way, if you do brush up against it, it won't contact your skin directly. So that's, that's a common one that's, that's problematic too, I think. And then of course, you've got your more mundane things like thorn bushes and sticker bushes and things like that. Again, a lot of those seem to grow near lowland areas, near creeks and such. And so that's just a matter of being cautious and not getting yourself uh, into those things, if at all possible, and having that barrier uh, on your skin too, with a clothing barrier will help those as well. I mean, they could still puncture through a lot of clothes, but at least the lighter brushes and stuff like that might not have much of an effect on you if you've got that barrier. Got it. What is the best way that we can learn about the types of hazardous plants in our area? So uh, guidebooks are good. Uh, online resources are good. I'm going to go ahead and plug our website again, mdc.mo.gov. <laughs> it, it truly is a good, a, good, a good resource. It's not the only one out there, but it's a good one. Um, again, uh, the, go to our the top of our webpage, Discover Nature, and then we have something called Field Guide under that. If you go to our Field Guide, you can type in whatever plant, animal, bird, whatever you want that occurs in Missouri, and you can get information about it, uh, pictures and habitat maps and characteristics and all that. So you can look a lot of this stuff up, poison ivy, uh, stinging nettle, you know, ticks, chiggers, you can look all that stuff up and get information from our website about it and photos. Okay. Would it be safe to guess that if we're in a different state, say Illinois, Iowa, wherever, they're conservation departments would probably have similar information available? Yeah, they might too. Um, and yes, if you are in Illinois or Northern Arkansas or whatever, you're probably going to encounter a lot of the same stuff. Now, if you go out West to like Cal um, California or Nevada or out far to Maine or somewhere that's pretty far away, uh, you might encounter some different stuff that you won't see here. And some of the stuff you encounter here may not be there, especially out west, because there tends to be a lot more different uh, 
different stuff out there than you might find here. Okay. Some people get concerned about encountering animals out in the wild. Mm -hmm. How concerned should people actually be about that? Is, is there really a big issue that people have encountering animals for the most part? Do they, you know, they just keep to themselves, don't they? They don't, unless they're hungry or threatened, they're going to leave you alone, right? Yes, pretty much. In fact, they're probably even leave you alone if they're hungry because there's not much in Missouri that eats people. Um, I can't say that for everywhere in the country or the world, but not in Missouri. There really aren't any man-eating animals so much here that where humans are the main thing they want to eat. Um, the Honestly, we've already covered the most risky things in the outdoors, and that's sugars, ticks, poison ivy, that's the most dangerous stuff that I can guarantee almost without a shadow of a doubt that you will encounter those right. things in the right areas and will be irritated by them. Um, however, when it comes to animals, you know, we're lucky in Missouri. We don't really have anything that's that dangerous in Missouri. You're not saying that you can't get hurt and you shouldn't treat all uh, wildlife with respect, both for your own good and for the wildlife itself, too. Um but the animals that you might possibly encounter that could cause you some harm are venomous snakes. So the most common ones uh, are that we will see in this area are copperheads uh, or timber rattlesnakes. And they can bite you and they, do, they can inject venom in you and the venom can cause you harm. So those are all possibilities. Now, with all that being said, a snake will never attack a human unless it feels threatened itself. Uh, the snake has no reason to go directly for a human and attack it. Um, snakes use their venom to secure prey, to eat. Uh, and the defensive aspect of, of the venom is secondary. Their main thing is to catch prey with it. And humans are not too big for snakes to eat. So they're not <laughs> after us as prey. So at least again, here, that's the case. I know there's some parts of the world that may not be, but in Missouri, you don't have to worry about a snake going after you to eat you. So most of the time when people are bitten, it's usually bitten on their hands or their arms when they're trying to pick it up or handle it or kill it. So that's the best thing you can do is just give the snake, if you see a snake, give it its distance. And if you're not sure whether it's venomous or not, because most snakes are not, the vast majority of snakes are not venomous here. Um, however, if you don't know, just assume it is and just give, give it its distance. So you definitely want to, um, if you see one on the trail, walk around it um don't step over it don't go in front of it just kind of walk around from behind it giving it plenty of space um don't try to kill it don't try to pick it up don't try to pet it don't try to get a close-up photo don't do any of those things um give it its distance uh now it is possible that you could do be doing the best thing you can be do and still end up getting bitten by a snake if you like say step on it and you don't see it's there right um, there's been instances of people putting their hand into wood piles to get wood out and there's a snake in there and they don't know it the snake feels threatened because the hand or the or the foot going to step on it so it could possibly strike you um the best thing to do again is a be careful where you step think about that when you're putting your hand somewhere and uh if you do have the opportunity like in a wood pile or something to put on some heavy leather gloves, not only protect your hand from cuts and scratches, but also give you a little protection against a possible animal bite. Um, and then wear those boots, uh, and that will help minimize any damage a snake could do if they bit you by accident, or not by accident, but because they felt threatened. Right. What should you do if you do get bitten by a snake, especially if you're not sure what kind of snake it is? Uh, medical attention. Get medical attention. Um, there's not much you can do in the field. Uh, I mean, you could put a little antiseptic on or something like that, which would be good even for non-venomous snakes because they could still have germs and stuff. Right. Um, but yes, you definitely want to get to help as soon as you can. I know this isn't always practical, but you should do the best you can to keep your heart rate down. So, you know, you don't want the heart beating faster because that's just going to circulate any possible venom faster. Okay. Um, if you get bit on the hand or whatever, try to keep it lower. So to have gravity in your favor so it doesn't, you know, uh, spread to the rest of your body. So that's one thing that you can do and then try to get help as soon as you can. Okay. There are, there are anti-venoms available that will help counteract the, the effect of the venom in snakes. So. Okay. So and stay like I said, calm and get medical attention is the best stay thing Stay calm. To 
you know, get medical attention. Don't do stuff like on TV where they cut it and suck the venom out and all that. <laughs> that, that. That can do more harm than good. And uh, so basically get, get professional medical attention. Um, you know, it's possible that even a venomous snake, they could bite and not inject venom. They don't always do that. Okay. Uh, but you don't, you don't know that. So you always assume they did and get treated for it. What about, we, we have nocturnal animals in our area, raccoons, bats. What do you do if you see those during the day for some reason? You see one out. Yeah, sure. So um, if you see it during the day, those are nocturnal animals, as you mentioned. So if you see it during the day, it could mean, not guaranteed, but it could mean they may have a disease or something and they may be disoriented or, or acting uh, abnormally. Um, again, keep your distance. Don't get too close. Um you know, you don't want to have any contact. Well, you want to keep give wildlife space anyway, regardless right. for your safety. It's also for the wildlife. But um, yeah, just keep your distance from it. Um, don't get too close. Don't again. Don't pick it up. Don't try to pet it. Don't try to take a close up with your phone. You know those kinds of things. Just common sense stuff, and you'll usually be okay. Now, um, you know, we do one of the other things that we might have some issues with going forward a little bit more is black bears. We do have bears in our state. They are increasing both in terms of their population and they're expanding their range. So that might be an issue possibly if you're like hiking or camping somewhere, especially in Southern Missouri. Um, so that's one thing to keep aware of. But again, they're most, a bear is not going to go after a human for food. Black bears don't. Um, but where they can be a problem is if people feed them or give them easy sources of food. Okay. And then once bears start becoming acclimated to people and they start associating them with food sources, then they can start getting more aggressive and, and expect food and get frustrated if they don't get it. And um, then they can start getting surly and uh, have problems, cause problems for humans and unfortunately for the bear ultimately too, because it usually ha means they have to be euthanized. So whenever you are camping, make sure that in areas where there are bears, make sure you seal your fruit up in, in bear tight containers, airtight containers, leave it in the car with the windows rolled up. Uh, certainly don't put it in your tent. Um, try to keep your eating area separate from your sleeping area uh, and basically don't leave any, any food out you know, overnight or whatever that might attract bears. Okay. And absolutely do not feed them deliberately. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. And the same advice would go for, say, like coyotes and bobcats and similar animals, right? Yes. You don't want to feed them uh, because, A, you don't want them to lose their fear of humans. Um, and, B, you could uh, get them habituated to humans and start expecting food. And you could create and you could be creating a problem for somebody else, if not for yourself. Um, you could be creating a problem for the animal because once they do start becoming a nuisance, that may end up it resulting in their euthanization. Sometimes our food is not even good for us, let alone for animals. So, you know, this, a lot of stuff we feed animals really isn't good for them. Right. Uh, like favorite is giving geese bread. That's really has no nutritional value for the goose. In fact, it can be unhealthy for them. Really? So, yes. So we don't recommend doing that. Plus, it makes them an annoyance because then they start coming to humans for food. So, <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, pretty well animals got along for millions of years before humans came along and they found their own food and they took care of themselves so they can continue to do so. Yeah. Yeah. If we come across an animal that looks like maybe it's injured or it's just not acting right, obviously we want to stay back, leave it at space. Is there somebody that we should be reporting that to, though? Should should animal control, the conservation department be notified, or should we just go on our way and let nature do its thing? Well, okay, so this is kind of difficult advice to give, but basically it's let nature do its thing. Um, because it's, you know, we all know, we've heard about the cycle of life from Disney and all that kind of stuff, but it is true. <laughs> You know, if, you know, animals get injured in the wild, in fact, there's animals that get injured and every single day and we just don't see it. Right. You know? So for every one you see that like that, there's been 10 others that you haven't seen and nature's done its thing. So if you do see an injured animal, probably there's not much you can do. It's just let nature take its course. If it's in the case of a raptor, like a, say an eagle or a hawk or something like that, there are um, 
places like the World Bird Sanctuary that can come out a lot of times and will retrieve them and try to treat them and re-release them back into the wild. Um, or if they can't treat them, to get them to a state where they can release them and they'd survive, they convert them into educational birds. And then they become educational ambassadors for programs and schools and educational programs. But those, and, and the reason they do that is because they're high up the food chain, there's fewer of them out there. And so um, they try to help them out. But for the most part, it's just nature's gonna do its thing. And, and another thing we have is when people see young animals, like you know, chicks, baby chicks, baby raccoons, baby fawns in the grass, uh, and people think, oh, I need to rescue them because the mother's not around or the parents are dead or whatever. And most of the time, that's not actually the case because um, a lot of times birds fall out of the nest as, while they're, and that's part of their learning to fly. You know, they get, they jump around on the ground and kind of get that feel a little bit. And then the parents can put them back in the nest. Um, uh, deer deliberately leave their fawns in grass and they leave the fawns so that their scent does not potentially attract predators. Fawns have spots on them that's kind of have them blend into the grass a little bit. So they will do that very commonly. The mother is close by, I guarantee you, and they're watching over the fawn. So don't think, oh, I got to save it, you know, kind of thing. Most of the time it's, it's good, it's well-meaning, but most people can't really treat animals. They can't really raise them properly. And they're just kind of interfering most of the time with the natural cycle of, of uh, parenting that the uh, parents do. Okay. So best to leave animals in the wild, leave them alone. Whether you think it's injured or whether you think it's abandoned, you know, most of the time they're actually not abandoned. And even if they were, if you try to bring them in and try to, you know, save them or whatever, you're probably, they're probably not going to survive because at some point you're going to have to re-release them into the wild. And so they have not had the proper training from their parents and the experience to survive anyway. That's good information. So as far as humans, as humans are concerned, if we are out in the woods and or some remote area, if we get lost, what is the most important thing to do? Uh, okay, so the most important thing to do is prevention. Um, the so one thing you can do is before you go out into the woods or wherever the remote area is, is let somebody know where you're going and when you're going. Right. So and, and maybe have an arrangement to um, contact them when you get back so they know you're back. So that way, if you get out somewhere in a remote area and you get lost or whatever, uh, and that person knows you haven't come back yet, they can contact help and let them know, hey, he's out in this area, he went out to this trail or whatever, or she's oh, camping on this site and we haven't heard back from her. And then they, they can send somebody and at least know generally where you are. So that helps. Um, the other thing is to carry your cell phone with you at all times. And obviously you could perhaps call, but there are places where uh, you don't get very good reception. But what I've found is that uh, most, most people today have cell phone plans that include texting. It's kind of more or less the standard thing. And uh, a lot of times the, you can send a text in areas where you can't get an actual cell phone signal okay. for a voice call. So what you can do, and a lot of cell phones now uh, have, of course, GPS is built in, or if you've got your handheld GPS, um, you can send a text message and your cell phone, you can oftentimes a fairly modern smartphone, it's relatively new, you can in, in, embed your uh, GPS coordinates, attach it like you would attach a photo or something. And that way um, you'll have your coordinates in your text or you can just copy it from your handheld GPS. And that will help a lot. You can take a photo of the area you're in and attach that. And that might be a reference point as well for someone to find you. So it may be a matter if you can't get, or if you have the phone, you can't get a reception here. Maybe it's a matter of climbing up a hill and you'll get reception. So it's always good to have that with you. Um, again, things we talked about, making sure you got that compass, the map, and the GPS, extra batteries for the GPS or a charger for your phone so that you've got that back up uh, to try to contact folks. Um, then of course, if you could leave a note in your car, you know, for emergency contact information. So say the authorities come, they see your car, they see it's their past due when it's, you know, should probably have been gone. Then you've got your 
your information in the window there, they can call somebody too. So those are a couple of things you can do. Okay. And then the other thing would be, be prepared, you know, make sure you've got some extra food, water, if it's going to likely get cold at night, have a jacket or, or something like that too. One thing that I have always heard is that if you're lost, ration your water. Is that actually a smart thing to do or is that a myth? So that's a little bit difficult. I have trouble with that myself because there's the old saying, uh, ration thirst, not water. And that's a good idea if you're somewhere where you can get water pretty reliably. Um, but if you're not somewhere where you can get water reliably, I think it's probably a good idea to, to ration what you have to get it to extend. Um, one of the things you can have, so it's a good idea if you're going out in remote, remote places to have a little emergency kit with you. And so the emergency kit would probably include obvious things like first aid kit, light, some form of light, fire starting stuff, whatever your preference is, there's different things. Um, emergency blanket or jacket or something, you know, those kind of emergency blankets you can fold up to the size of your hand, basically. Okay. Um, throw one of those in there. Um, and then the other thing that would be bad to have in there is some kind of a uh, method to purify water. So whether it's a pump or pumps aren't the most portable, but you could also have tablets like chlorine or iodine based tablets, uh, or they have these like little life straw type things that they sell a lot of places. You can get them for 10 to $20 that you, that, fil that do filter water, like little personal water purifiers. Wouldn't be bad to have one of those in your little emergency kit as well. So that way, if you do run out of water or something and you see a stream or you see a body of water that you can get some water out of, uh, even a puddle, um, you can use, you can uh, get that water, extract it and purify it with tablets or your little mini purifier. And now you have some water. Okay. And, 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 and these little purifiers, you can, I've seen them in department stores and outdoor stores and all that. And they're something you could easily put in a pack in a little emergency kit. They're not really huge and heavy or anything. Uh, and then there's the tablets. The, um, the tablets are the lightest weight and easiest to carry, but they also take a while to work. Okay. All tablets okay. take a while you, and then you have to wait on it. The nice thing about the little pump things or the little life straw type stuff is they work instantly. So you can extract the water, immediately start drinking it. Okay, okay. That's good to know. Yeah, and then always carry flashlight, always carry you know first aid kit, all the standard stuff, some extra food um, in case, you know, and bring more water than you think you'll need. Um, so that's always helpful too. Okay. Different wooded areas and different conservation areas allow different types of hunting, obviously different seasons, different types of the year. Mm -hmm. How can we safe you know stay safe why out in the woods when you may be around hunters because most of the time hunters will have camouflage on unless it's deer season and you may not know they're there sure so well again it goes back to being prepared i mentioned our website mdc.mo.gov and um uh under the discover nature and places to go tab the same place where you would download a map or from an area or whatever you can also see in those same resources will show you what hunting is available on the area or permitted on the area. Okay. Um, so that will tell you what hunting is, what, what hunters could hunt on the area. And then our site will also give you current seasons of what's, uh, what's uh, in season to hunt. So going in with that knowledge will help you understand what might happen what could be what, what hunters might be out there and what they might be hunting for um general knowledge of seasons is helpful like for example summer not too much hunting going on in the summer right. so you know you don't have to worry so much about that um the as you get into the fall though like uh september october november yes there will be deer hunters especially archery hunters will be out most of that time or could be out, could be out most of that time. And in the spring and May, or late late April and early May is, is spring turkey season. So there will be tur turkey hunters possibly out in the woods. Right. So those are some things to be aware of. 
Um, I would recommend maybe not going to those places um, during those times if you're concerned. Uh, if you do go, really good precautions wear Hunter Orange. Um, get yourself like a Hunter Orange vest or some similarly like a safety vest like people have out working on the, in the roads and stuff like that <clears throat> and wear that. So that'll help cue potential hunter to know, hey, that's a person. Um, in during the spring, avoid wearing red, white, and blue, which are tur uh, colors often associated with turkeys. Um, again, that yellow vest uh, or hunter orange vest will, uh, will help you stand out. And that's something easily purchased at pretty much any sporting goods store. Yeah, absolutely, yes. You can buy that at any sporting goods store, um, and especially the one that sells hunting stuff. So just, uh, you know, yeah, you'll be able to find it there and just wear something like that, like hunter orange, really bright orange. The other thing you can do if it is a concern, like during the, uh, say, the 10 days of firearms deer season, which occur in November, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it's a good idea. Just don't go to a conservation area during those 10 days. You know, um, you could, but I mean, they're not closed to hikers and geocachers, but maybe there's other places like state parks that do not allow hunting or only allow specialized managed hunts. So maybe that's a good time to go to those areas. And um, just, you know, some of those really high hunting periods like that 10 day uh, period for firearms deer season would be a good time to maybe consider going elsewhere. And just for your own safety, you know, uh, to do that. Now there are times where certain state parks will have managed hunts where there may be a day or a weekend that they allow a hunt only for the, that limited period of time. Usually that's to control deer numbers because there's too many deer. So again, those should be posted typically in those areas. They're going to still occur in the fall sometime. So just those are good things to be aware of. And again, wear that hunter orange or the highly reflective safety vests. What is the number one thing you would recommend somebody takes out into the woods or remote areas when they're out hiking or geocaching in them? Hmm. Well, the number one thing that's, we've talked a lot about it already. Um, so it's hard to stay, uh, pick one thing. Okay. I'm going to say something that's kind of weird, but I'm going to say it anyway. And that's common sense. <laughs> take, take common sense with you. Um, because I think that will, you know, alleviate a lot of issues and common sense could be what to take with you in terms of stuff, you know, where are you going to go? Where are you going to be? Like you said, is there going to possibly be hunting in this area at this time? Make sure you got that reflective vest and or hunter orange. Um, are you going somewhere where the trails in more remote areas where they may not be as well marked? Well, make sure you got your GPS and your map and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, is it possible it might rain? Make sure you do bring some kind of rain gear or even an umbrella or an emergency poncho. Is it possible the temperature is going to drop? You know, make sure you've got layers of clothing. Uh, you've looked at the weather. Um, another thing, which isn't so bad this time of year, but as you get into the fall um, and the daylight starts changing, a lot of people underestimate how soon it's going to get dark. So make sure you're aware of when the sun is going to set so you know that you don't want to start out on a hike that's going to take four hours when there's only two hours of daylight left. And so just th that's all common sense stuff. Do you have spare batteries for your GPS? You know, is it charged? Is your phone charged? Or do you have a portable charger for it? Uh, you know, just a lot of good common sense stuff like that. So it's, it's hard to say one thing. Water is really important, <laughs> but so is, you know, navigation. So is the proper clothing. Make sure you got the proper boots or footwear. And, and footwear, don't forget, also includes socks. You want to have the right socks because if you don't have the right socks, you can get blisters and be very uncomfortable or get wet and stay wet so you want um, wool socks are typically the best um, and then um, you know proper clothing and all that for what you're going to do um, I also too I know you know a lot of folks here obviously have GPSs and they're used to working them and comfortable using them but a map is still a good thing to have because uh, the GPS can show you where you've been or maybe to where a certain cache might be, a particular location. 
but they don't always tell you where you're supposed to go on a trail. Right. Um, now, sometimes you do, you can download databases that do have the trails in, in the databases of the GPSs, but not always. So it's good to have that map to know where the trail actually goes. Yes, the GPS will show you where you've been and will trace where you're, you're you know, where you're, where you've gone so far, but it can't necessarily tell you, gee, do I go left here or do I go right here when there's a, a fork? Right. So a map can maybe tell you that. Now, obviously, if you're geocaching, then you know you're you're going to a particular waypoint. So maybe that isn't as relevant because you kind of know where to go. But also, uh, the GPS, again, is not going to account for the trail. It's just going to account for, okay, the cache is over here, but it's still nice to know how the trail, because trails very rarely go in a straight line. And that's what your, your GPS is going to assume when you're going toward a cache. It's straight. It's just going to give you the dead ahead coordinates. So you may have to go follow a trail in, in, in um, you know, indirect way to actually get to the cache okay. and having that map to know how the trail is going to go. Yes, I know the GPS says I need to go that way, but the trail um, trail is going to wind around and get me there eventually. So you have the map to know how you're going to get there. Okay. So that's, it's a really good thing to have both, I find. And if you're hiking, like I said, it's good to know where the trail goes and, and you know, what to expect ahead which the GPS may or may not show you. Are you aware of any issues that have been caused by geocachers that have just disregarded the path and just followed the GPS straight line to get someplace? I don't know of any specific things associated with GPS uh, users or uh, geocachers. I'm not, I, there may have been, I just don't know about them. Uh, generally speaking, though, it's a good idea to stay on the trails for all benefits, um, A, for yourself, because, again, we talk about chick, chiggers and ticks and poison ivy and, and things like that. And when you get off trails into the woods, into the grasses, you're more likely to encounter those things or poison ivy or whatnot. Um, but also for respect to the habitat and the environment to keep our traffic and our wear along the trails and not, you know, impact the rest of the habitat by walking through, you know, stuff where there isn't a trail, bushwhacking and, and so forth. And it's easier to get lost. You know, I know you have your GPS, so you can always find your way back to the trail again. But, you know, it's, it's, it's also protecting the habitat. If we keep our, our impact on the trails and near the trails, and then I think we'll be better off protect for our own safety and we'll be protecting the habitat and the animals and the plants and stuff uh, in the woods too, by not walking on them and tearing through them and creating our own trails. Is there anything else you can think of that people should know about about anything we talked about today or anything specific about the conservation department you'd like to share with us or, or anything else? Oh, sure. So yeah, the conservation department here is here as a resource for, you know, we serve all Missouri citizens and, um, you know, we, of course we facilitate and manage hunting and fishing and the wild and enforce the wildlife code. But we also do a lot of other things like open our areas to geocaching, to hiking, some areas to camping, fishing, paddling you know and kayaking canoeing and whatnot so we have a lot of um, bird watching so there's a lot of different things that folks do on our areas and that we support and encourage um so you know our again plug the website again mdc.mo.gov but they say you, you got to repeat things seven times for people to remember it but um the i don't i think i'm getting close to seven times now but the uh it's a great resource for learning about nature learning about hunting and fishing seasons, but also about nature, about our areas. Uh, there's a lot of great hiking trails, whether you're going to geocache or just hike uh, with your GPS, a lot of great places to, to do that. When I've gone float trips, I usually also track my GPS as well with that. So just to, just to have a little memory of where I went and have that stored in a database somewhere. So that's just like a scrapbook, I guess. So, even, you know, so there's a lot of things you can do, even if you're not directly geocaching, that you can make use of your GPS and, and enjoy our areas with it. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, just get out and discover nature. A lot of great stuff out there. And that's what's cool about geocaching is it kind of gives you that 
sense of a purpose to get out and do something a little bit high tech. So folks who love the high, you know, the, the technology connection, but you're also getting out in nature and experiencing the sights and sounds of nature. So it's a great combination, actually. It is. It really is, especially for the youth these days that are so have been so much brought up with all this technology, even in school and every place else. And they they want to have that technology and it can help them have a taste of that technology and still get them outside experiencing nature and doing something different and, and healthy for themselves. Yeah, you know, there was a there's a period of time where a lot of natural resource agencies and entities like ours were waging wars against smartphones. You know, it's us against the phone kind of and you know, we want to get people outdoors and not get them off their phones. And I mean, yes, definitely we want to get people outdoors and all that. And it's always good to put your phone down for a little while. But you can integrate the two with geocaching, with uh, I bring my phone out with me all the time because I always even I even don't I don't geocache a lot personally, but I use my GPS all the time for hiking, tracking, and just um, keeping a, a sort of a memory of where I went, like taking photos. Only it's a, a GPS trace, but also there's apps that are really very helpful for identifying uh, plants, flowers, birds, frog calls. Um, butterflies, you name it. There's a stars, you know, to, to help you learn the stars in the sky. So a lot of great, and then the apps, of course, will tell you sunset and sunrise times and, and various kinds of things. Um, so yes, there's definitely a great way to integrate all that stuff in with the outdoors and enhance your, your enjoyment of the outdoors. Plus provide you a measure of safety if you need to contact somebody uh, in case of something happens. Right. So yeah, there's, there's, I think instead of us against them, it's more like, Hey, let's all join together and enhance the experience and make it better. So I like that. Yeah. And I've got to say the Missouri conservation department has some amazing programs and activities for all ages. We, I can remember going as a kid and fishing out at Bush wildlife with my parents or going to a, a youth archery safety thing and learning about bows i remember going to programs about just box turtles there i don't even remember what the program was but i remember going to this program and learning about box turtles at one of the conservation centers so there's a lot of great different activities through the conservation department that people may not know about but they can find information about it on your website absolutely which is again mdc.bo.gov MDC. <laughs> yeah that's right so that's about eight times so people should know it now but also yes on that uh website at the top again there's an events tab and that will give you all the classes that we offer and you can filter it by re it gives you statewide stuff but you can filter it by region it's like so if you're in the st louis area or you're in springfield or wherever you can go ahead and put that in there too and that'll give you just the classes that are being offered in, in your area and you're right we have a wide variety of stuff so you know, it's all free. So we are taxpayer funded. And so um, you guys are paying for it already in your taxes and your sales tax, one eighth of one cent sales tax. So you might as well take advantage of it and uh, enjoy it. So there's a lot of different classes that we offer. Absolutely. And even some on geocaching on occasion. Yes. And even so on geocaching once in a while. So yeah, definitely. And map and compass, we do offer those sometimes too. So if you want to go a little bit more old school with it, that's uh that's another option as well. I might have to check that one out. That one sounds fun. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining me today and and talking about all these different outdoor nuisances and safety tips and, and how to help us stay safe and active while we're out in the woods. I really do appreciate you taking the time to do this today. Sure. I hope it was helpful for you and got something out of it, hopefully. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Geocache Adventures. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Have you heard of FTF Magazine? It's the magazine for geocachers, filled with articles and snippets sent in by geocachers just like you. I'm a subscriber myself, and I love it. Check them out today at ftfgeo.com and tell them Shadow Dragon 1 sent you. Would you like to be a guest on a show or have a topic you'd like to hear covered? reach out and let me know. Just go to the geocacheadventures.org website and click on the contact page to reach out.